Hello, this is uh, Chris Helton from the Dorkland blog, and I'm bringing you a special edition of uh, the Dorkland Roundtable, this time powered by sunlight. Um, and my guest uh, today is Wolfgang Bauer of um, Open Design, Kobold Quarterly, and a number of other uh, fun publications and, and publishing houses. Hello, yeah. Wolfgang. Hey, good to be here. Um, usually I like to start these things off uh, with a bit of uh, uh, history and uh, ask uh, my guests uh, what, what the first game they played and uh, roughly about how old they were when, it, when they did that. Wow. Well, the first role-playing game or just the first game? Uh, first role-playing game. Oh, okay. That makes it a little easier. Yeah. Well, it, it, <laughs> it was Dungeons & Dragons and it was in the... Time around 1979-1980, the blue box. Mm. I had seen a red dragon on a blue box down at the local hobby store, and I think I, I mentioned it probably 500 times to my parents <laughs> that there was such a thing before Christmas, um, and it was a Christmas gift, and then I dragged the friends and neighbors into it. So I think my little sister and the neighbor kid were my first players. Well, you know, there's worse ways to start. No, it was a fun way to start. Yeah, those those early days when you didn't really know how it was supposed to work, and it just worked according to, you know, what kind of weird stuff you managed to to put into into yeah. your head. It was sort of yeah. What is this fun? Does this make sense? Let's do it that way. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I often asked uh, myself or my players, "Does this make sense?" At those times, but the is <laughs> does it make sense at the moment? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> D d you know, should I have Ming the Merciless in this in this dungeon? Yes, that makes perfect sense to me. Yes, <laughs> because it's fun. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, what sort of games did you did you move to from there once you once you got the bug? I was pretty much a a Dungeons and Dragons regular for quite a while, uh, and then I went to Gen Con, like Gen Con eighteen or so, seventeen, somewhere around there. Um, and we had to have, you know, a parent drive us up, and it was up in Wisconsin, not in Indianapolis. But we got there, me and all my gaming buddies, and we played a ton of games, and then we went to the dealer room. Oh. <laughs> and somebody demoed this cool science fiction game for me uh, called Paranoia. And it was all about lasers and killing off clones, and it was funny, and the guy running it was hysterical. I was like, wow, this is great. I would like to buy one. And I said, well, you know, it's a new game, and we don't have the box that the game comes in yet, so we can just sell you the booklets here at the con, because it's not out yet. And I'm like, well, that's even cooler. It's not even out yet. <laughs> um, and then the guy who had been running the little demo said, well, would you like me to sign it? And I said, huh? Oh, you're the writer? Oh, great. Yeah, it turned out <laughs> it's Ken Rolston, the designer of Paranoia. I was like, yeah, here. So I have a signed first printing copy of Paranoia that we then kind of beat to death that summer, um, you know, killing off clones and doing ludicrous things. Uh, and then we moved on to oh, a couple other TSR things. I think we played a few games at Boot Hill. Uh, we certainly played Gamma World a bunch. Uh, and then later RuneQuest and Pendragon. So yeah, it kind of branched out slowly, and those all tended to be one-shots, right? It's like, well, we're just going to play Pendragon for a little while. Uh, and then we go back to D and D. Yeah, that that happens with a lot of people going back to D and D. Now, are D, are your interests more towards um, uh, more a strict fantasy type of gaming, or more like uh, science fiction, or some sort yeah. of weird, unholy? <laughs> well, I mean, my interests kind of go all over the place, depending. Um, I certainly have played my share of Call of Cthulhu lots and lots of that because I've got a regular group that I started playing with when I was uh, at TSR and that group has survived oh okay yeah, we're coming up on our 20 year mark right mm -hmm. um, obviously the characters in Call of Cthulhu do not survive but <laughs> yeah if you have a 20 year old Call of Cthulhu character somebody's doing something <laughs> either really right or really wrong <laughs> yeah, exactly exactly so we've been through a lot of characters and we've played all the big uh, campaign sets and we're pretty hardcore about that. Um, but I would say, yeah, mostly fantasy with ventures off into horror, uh, conspiracy gaming. I mean, I wrote Dark Matter 
with Monty Cook for Wizards of the Coast, and that that was all conspiracy gaming mm -hmm. and modern firearms. So, um, but yeah, yeah I think. Oh, I was going to say the meat and potatoes. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that I, the first time I think I noticed your name on a credit was for the the book of uh, Dark Matter. Yeah. I mean, that was a big book, and glossy, and beautiful, and no one had quite done a conspiracy game that way before. Um, it's, and the it's a I beautiful mean, it, thing. Yeah, and they brought it back then in the D20 system later, right? They, uh, mm -hmm. they reissued it after the Alternity game system went away, uh, reissued it as a D20 modern game. Now, which do you like better, the Alternity or the, the D20 modern version? i got to say, I sort of like the the degrees of success rules in Alternity, um, I thought that worked fine. I've only played it once with D20 Modern, and it works. Um, I don't know, I have a weird fondness for the Alternity rule set. That's something you don't really hear a lot about is, I mean, you don't hear people talking about Alternity. It's it, it, no. it's almost one of the, the, the red-headed stepchilds of, uh, yeah. of you know, TSR and, and Wizards and the stuff. Well, I think modern gaming and science fiction gaming, I mean, other than Traveler and maybe a few of the horror crossovers you see now, um, I mean, it's always been a smaller pond, right? Paranoia yeah. was sort of a small, humorous game that that did better than anyone expected. Um, conspiracy games, something like Delta Green is huge by Cthulhu standards, but... <laughs> it's yeah, really, it's a small, yeah, relatively small community. Well, you know, and I've never really thought of of paranoia. I mean, despite all of what's in it, it as being a science fiction game, I always thought of oh come on, paranoia and being, lasers as being well. It's I've always seen it as more of a, as a you know a humor sat, a satirical game first, mm -hmm. and then you yeah. know the science fiction is just there to you know give you like laser beams to kill crap with. That's, it's certainly not hard science fiction. Yeah. It's certainly jokes first and yeah. uh, science second. But I don't know. I guess we, we thought of it as a science fiction yeah. game, but then we thought Gamma World was a science fiction game, too. <laughs> giant, rob or giant robots. Giant rabbits for the win, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. So, you know, um, we are willing to goof around with some of that stuff, but when we wanted hard science fiction, it was pretty much a traveler. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I, I just have never maintained a science fiction campaign for the length of time I've maintained fantasy campaigns. I think the only thing I've ever maintained long-term science fiction-wise would have been uh, cyberpunk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I should have done that. I was such a fan of Gibson and Sterling and Rucker and pretty much every cyberpunk novelist. I, I read everything that came out. Um... I think I was too fussy to game in that universe, though. It's like, I, you know, people should... Or maybe I wasn't ruthless enough to push the body count the way it should have gone, because those are fairly... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Believe me. I, <laughs> um, I actually had to get my, my first copy of Cyberpunk uh, via mail order direct from the publisher, because I couldn't find a comic, or, you know, a comic or a gaming store that even knew what right. the hell I was talking about, let alone who was carrying it. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I was like, you know, I've got this review in a magazine. It's got an ad. I will just write to them, and mm -hmm. next thing I know, I've got a shiny black box set in my hand. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, some genres are a little harder to to sustain, but I think RPGs have kind of covered all of them, right? Um, yeah, there's really not. I mean, other than maybe like weird. Um, you know, French modern filmmaking, I think um, mm -hmm. a lot of the genres have been covered in, in RPGs. I'm, I'm going to get an email from the designer of the French modern <laughs> filmmaking <laughs> indie story game saying, you guys totally overlooked me. <coughs> yeah, I, I mean, the big genres are there, and they, they follow the trends from, from film or novels and and the one thing that kind of worries me now is that we do see a lot of licensed properties, but we see less original RPG properties, right? I mean, um, the Game of Thrones RPG is awesome, um, but there's no longer a sense that, like, Dragonlance, you know, was an RPG property first and, yeah. and sort of spread out into the culture from there. So 
I'm kind of looking for the next cool RPG setting. Well, what about yours? Well, <laughs> yeah, all right, there's the, that. The, the, the interviewer says is a segue. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. I mean, I've got Midgard coming out in October, and I'm really excited about it. It's uh, it's a traditional fantasy RPG setting, and it does a few things differently, but it's familiar, right? That's kind of the balance I'm always fighting in fantasy. Is It's a fairly conservative genre, but you want to do something new. So it's a flat world where you know there really are blank areas of the map uh, where dragons live, okay? And it's an apocalyptic setting. The Empire of Elves has fallen. Um, and it's got new races, right? Like the raven folk are in there. Um, and the Minotaurs and the Kobolds play a bigger role than they do in most fantasy settings. I'm shocked that Kobolds play such a large role. <laughs> exactly, right? You know, who could have suspected it? But uh, it's like, it draws on things that I was running in high school, right? There's stuff on the map that was on my map, like on little hex grid paper from the Greyhawk days. Um, <laughs> And then there's things that I've only added to it, like, in the last five years. So it's, what I love about Midgard is that it's got a long history. It's got a deep well of things to draw from. And so it's not a setting that I tried to rush or force for a publication date, right? I have plenty of time to think about it. Um, so Leyline Magic is in it. The Shadow Plane is in it. All of these things are sort of deeply layered into the setting and people seem to like it and we'll see what they say in a month now that uh, the the question that brings up then for me is um, what sort of what sort of influences went into over the you know the journey of, of Midgard what sort of influences went into its creation you know what what books what what is right. what what sort of things do you you know you or, you know, you're in the middle of reading a book and you go, crap, I've got to write this down because this will be awesome in my game. Yes. Uh, well, some of it is books. I mean, I think all of the the Leyline Shadow Magic stuff actually probably owes a fair bit to Roger Zelazny and Nine Princes and Amber and that sense of you just step through um, into another world. Um, there's other things that are very much drawn from, like, the Conan or Greyhawk tradition, right? It's it's a dark world, and the magic is deep and old. Um, so there's those things that, that resonate for me as the parts of fantasy I like. Um, and then there's the Western Wastes, which pretty much everybody who's been watching this project develop says, yeah, those are awesome. I mean, that's where the Cthuloid dark, blasphemous elder walkers go across the landscape, destroying everything in front of them. Um, it's it's as close to what the uh, the Sea of Colorless Fire or uh, a Gamma World radioactive glass scape uh, as you can get in a fantasy setting, right? Um, so it's the place where all the weird stuff comes from. Uh, my goal was, hey, let's have an explanation for stuff like mind flares and all these tentacles that seem to show up everywhere. <laughs> Right. Um, so the Western Waste is where magic gets warped and weird. Um, did you ever play uh, any Warhammer? Yeah, I played a little Warhammer. Um, I was just wondering because that does sound kind of Warhammer-ish. It is a little. There's no chaos stones yeah. and there's no rattlings. Um, and that's it's that's a where you went wrong. Is no rattlings. I know. It's rattlings gonna, it's are gonna, cool. It's going to be in reviews. You you know it now. <laughs> Why I the know. hell doesn't this have ratlings? There are no <laughs> Skaven in this product. I am so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I hope the Raven folk are something new and people dig that, but we'll see. Uh, you know, Warhammer, I think, should be a big influence. I like their tone. I like the Dark World of Perilous Adventure um, style. But it tends to be... That's way more over the top, usually, yeah. with the chaos and Nurgle cults and those things. Midgard kind of tries to pare it back a little bit um, from that level of, uh, of world-ending weirdness. Well, I think it's the Lovecraftian kind of... It, it got yep. into, you know, um, Warhammer probably through RuneQuest, and then yeah. the, the, those, those kooky English guys kind of cranked it up to, like, 
15. And... Yeah, and the minis are great, and like the visual look of it is fantastic. But I tried to play Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay once, and I did not care for the mechanics. So I don't know. Yeah, I know I'm, there are people who love it, and I just I'm, apparently not one of them. Yeah, I'm in that school too. I I, I love the. Uh, I recently kind of after. Because I, I, I do some games that I run here online, and after a couple of months of people going, wow, this is like Warhammer, I decided to finally go back and pick some of the stuff up and go, huh, this this is sort of like Warhammer. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think I think that's a reasonable direction to go, right? They were there first. They did a yeah. really great job with this sort of blasted points of light kind of setting, um, and they've carried it for years and years yeah. and years. So I'm glad it's around. Well, and it's also, I mean, it's interesting to see how, you know, you take the the, the sort of the similar <laughs> in, inspirations. Like, because in my case, I think the reason why people kept saying, oh, this looks like Warhammer is because, you know, I was taking a heavy influence from, you know, Lovecraft and, and yep. Michael Moorcock and things like that. And when, when, you, when you put those two things together and kind of crank it up in a fantasy game, everyone kind of expects it to be Warhammer-ish. Yeah, and I think that's fine, right? There are people who are going to say, oh, well, this is sort of like Warhammer, or yeah. you're running a game kind of like Warhammer. Um, and it's a really good tradition for fantasy RPGs, and kind of carrying that forward is is fine. Well, I mean, it's good to have a variety of, of approaches, you know, because yep. not, not everyone's as big on the, you know, all high fantasy all the time. Yep. Oh, I love me some low fantasy, and I've run the home campaign of Midgard through sessions that have been, you know, sort of big planar exploration stuff, and I've done things that are more uh, gritty, urban, you know, let's fight the thieves guild, low magic stuff. I think a single a single campaign setting can hold multiple play styles, right? It just oh. depends who's running it and what the group is into. Now, um, what do you run your home campaign with? What what game system? Well, let's see. Uh, <laughs> this is this is this is going to cause more emails. I know. <laughs> this is going to cause more emails. Well, this is my problem, right? I mean, for a long time, uh, Cobalt Quarterly has had a slogan on the cover for at least a year and a half. You know, the Switzerland of the edition wars, um, because we we don't necessarily commit to a rule system all the time. Um, at the moment, it's Pathfinder. Um, before then, it was 4th edition D&D. &D. Uh, before that, it was 3.5 D&D. &D. Uh, before that, it was... What was it? You know, it was probably run 2nd Ed for a while. Yeah, so I mean, it's mostly been D&D, &D, and then Pathfinder is a D&D &D branch, so that's all in that tradition. Uh, I tried running it with the Dragon Age rule set from Green Ronin. Um, and that was fun. Yeah, I saw the like the creatures that you did for for Dragon Age. Those yeah, were, those were very cool. I like that sort of approach to. Yeah, you know that system needs. I don't know. It needs more supplements, is what I think. <laughs> but the the Green Ronin guys not unreasonably are pursuing their um, Game of Thrones game, right? Yeah. The Song of Ice and Fire RPG. It's great. They've got an HBO series. Why wouldn't they be yeah. uh, putting, you know, their limited staff and resources into that? And they're doing great with it. So I think Dragon Age is it's not a redheaded stepchild, but it's the number two or yeah. the number three behind Mutants and Masterminds yeah. and, and Westeros. Yeah, if if they have a redheaded stepchild, it would probably be True Twenty, but we won't go there. No, let's <laughs> not, I don't want all those emails. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, it, I mean, it, you know, it, it, Dragon Age is a really good uh, system. And I like. Well, I mean, I like a sort of low magic. Um, yep, it's low magic. It's fast and flexible. Yes. I mean, it's it's not quite a beer and pretzels RPG, but it's headed that way. Yeah. Um, and sometimes after you know a, a particularly complex run of fourth edition or Pathfinder, it's like let's do something simpler. So. That's when I reach for Dragon Age. Yeah, actually, I think when when your uh, when your uh, Midgard stuff comes out, I w I'm actually considering using it for uh, an open quest game. Oh, cool! So, oh, I'd love to hear I'm, some write ups on that. I'm, I'm a I'm a big fan. Well, I'm I'm a you know a big uh, d uh, 
percentile, whatever you want to, the BRP derivatives uh -huh. thing. And I was one of the the backers for their second edition Indiegogo campaign, so I'm oh, waiting fantastic. with bated breath to get my new, my shiny new game book for, for OpenQuest. But I just Excellent. thought Mid Midgard would be a neat um, uh, setting that would uh, sync up well with the, that sort of RuneQuestian sensibility. I think it does, actually, and I've had other, well, so this is sort of what I was saying earlier, right? That other people have said, well, I really love the setting and I'm just adapting it to the system I prefer, right? So we still have fourth edition players running with it. Uh, we still have um, Dragon Age and Pathfinder players running with it, and it wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, Open Quest could pick it up, and somebody in Louisiana says he's turning his 13th age game wow. into a Midgard game. There's people in Louisiana that game. Oh yeah! I, I'm just kidding. One of my <laughs> friends is who, who who might watch this sooner or later is there, so I have to get a swing at people from Louisiana if I can. Yep, gamers everywhere. It's kind of yep. cool. Um, actually, and we were talking about questions uh, popping yeah. up online. Actually, I just got one, and uh, I'm not sure if the it's right. Uh, you know, I well, I can't answer it myself. So. Um, All right. Tony Pace was asking uh, if you wrote uh, Chromosome for the Amazing Engine. I did. Oh my goodness, that was my first standalone campaign setting. Apparently, uh, apparently our talk of Cyberpunk uh, brought that up. Yeah, I had been reading uh, a lot of Rudy Rucker and like biopunk stuff, I and I said, "Why don't we?" Well, and I had a just gone to graduate school for biochemistry, cell and molecular biology. I had done a little bit of genetic engineering on algae, um, created some new life forms in the lab, <laughs> and then I went to work for TSR, and I'm like, well, damn, my education's going to waste. Can I write a cyberpunk setting that's, that's uh, full of <laughs> weird biotech? And yeah, I loved writing that thing. I could not fit everything I wanted into uh, under the covers, I think it was like ninety-six pages, one hundred and twenty-eight on. Yeah, the those outside. those were really tiny because I've got I've got one of the other amazing. It I don't have Chrome because actually it came up in a conversation on on my thing the other day because I posted for uh, one of the yeah. other people the uh, the freelancers novel because it right. came up in one of my other ram tables. I posted it and someone went, "Hey, isn't that the cover to Chromosome?" And I'm like, "I, I don't know." Yes, it and, is. <laughs> and. <laughs> And um, so that started a, 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 a mini conversation about chromosome. Yeah, in, that's one of those cyberpunk settings that, well, Amazing Engine stuff was all kind of tossed out there with the sense of, uh, it's an experiment, right? Fairy Queen and Country. Um, oh, man, there were... There was that, yeah. There was the Bug Hunters one was the first one. And it was a great little series. They were all very inventive. Um, but I, I don't know that any of them caught fire. Really? <clears throat> yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioning Rudy Rucker because I've been a huge Rudy Rucker fan for a long time. I even, even though I have the product of a liberal arts education, I've even read his mathematics books. Ooh. But yeah, right. I know that's hardcore. But um, about a month ago, I got a response to a tweet from him, and really? I'm just sitting there looking at my screen, going, "Holy crap! Rudy Rucker just tweeted to me." <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's like, a, uh, do I follow up or do I just take this as a high point and move on? <laughs> yeah, let's just favorite that. Let's keep yeah. that. <laughs> well, you know, he's still around. He's still, yeah. I think, teaching and writing. Yeah, yeah. I think he's, yeah, he's still teaching. But, yeah, it's, uh, um, so, you know, if, say if you could, one of these old properties that you had sure. done for, for someone else, if if for some reason for a very meager fee. They they came available and said, you know, hey, we, we don't want this this stuff anymore. You know, why don't you take one of these things off our hands? If you could redo sure. one of your old things like that, what would it be? Oh, it has to be one of mine. All right. Uh, well, we can we can do another of uh, you know oh, somebody no, else's after, but we'll, we'll okay. start with we'll start with what of yours would you redo and how would you redo uh, it? Do you think? Wow. Um. I'm pretty sure I would go back to Al Qadim, even though I didn't do the core books. Um, although it's hard to capture lightning in a bottle like that twice. I mean, the Al Qadim series was only supposed to be two years long, and it was great, and it was beautiful, and then it was gone. Um, 
so it seems like high time for a revival on some of that. Um, I'm surprised we haven't seen an, an Al Qadim revival. I mean, I wasn't playing D and D during the second edition, mm -hmm. so I but I had a lot of friends who still were obviously. Yeah. I mean, but and, and I know not data or anything, but most of them were all involved more in Al Qadim stuff than with mm -hmm. a lot of the other things like you know Dark Sun or stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, Dark Sun has come back, and the realms never left, and uh, settings come and go. But that one, um, I think what I like about it and what people like about it generally is it doesn't try to be uh, dark and gloomy and gritty. It's like the anti-Warhammer, right? Um, <laughs> it's like, well, the Thief of Baghdad and Ray, Ray Harryhausen, there's clear good and evil in it. But the good guys really are the good guys. They're not, you know, being duped by the whatever it is, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, the Skaven or uh, some you know, Nurgle cult. So, well, you I, know, that's something you don't really see a lot of in gaming yeah. either. Is you don't get a lot of clear cut. This is good. This is bad. You know. I think that's part of the appeal, though. I mean, Al Qadim really harkens back to that Arabian Nights storytelling. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, these really are the bad guys. Let's go kill them, and. Oh, this guy really is the good guy. There's, there's less. I know that Greyhawk and other settings love to to flaunt their uh, shades of gray and mature subject matter, and uh, I don't know, a sense of complexity. But the simplicity sometimes, of yeah, you know, Indiana Jones level yeah. simplicity. I like that. Yeah, you know, sometimes there's you know, you just want to play a yep. good guy who's a good guy for the sake of being a good guy. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be fun. It would be fun to go back to Al Qadim, revisit that. Um, if I were to look at someone else's properties, right, um, I might look at the other uh, great game to come from the cyberpunk folks, namely Castle Falkenstein, I think is way overdue for a revival. Um, it's got, well, it's got more intrigue. It's got steampunk before steampunk was cool. Um, and it's got that sort of Oh, it's got a sense of wonder and European courtliness that I think could go over very well with a new audience, right? It's not pulp D and D. It's not horror. It's not really modern. It's almost Victorian. Yeah. Um, so I think that would be fun to play with, just as a one shot. Yeah, it was a fun game. It had some really neat uh, things to it, you know, like the 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 intrigue elements and. Yep. <clears throat> I, I'd I think. Like it had a limited audience, right? I mean, it was oh, very yeah. much a niche game. And, uh, I don't know, I like looking at some of the niche games, too. Well, it was sort of ahead of its time. I think if it had come out, you know, closer to when Steampunk started becoming more popular, it probably would have become, a, you know, found more of an audience, maybe been more of a hit than it, it actually was. Yeah, I mean, the highlights for me of Falkenstein have been, or were, uh, some of the live-action events at Gen Con that they put on which feel, in, in retrospect, very much like the costume ball stuff that, that every steampunk society ever puts on. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's a natural fit. Um, heck, it would be fun to go even revisit some of the, uh, the other super old stuff, like Empire of the Petal Throne, I guess is still in print. That's like um, one of the... M Empire of the Petal Throne, from my understanding, is being revisited by Jeff D. Is it really? Yes. Well, that's good news. I, I I've seen some of the things I've seen pop up in his stream here, and he's he's talked about because he's a big uh, EPT fan. Oh, okay. And apparently he has been talking with the the rights holders, and um, it looks like he's going to be doing a new uh, a new game in that in that universe. Oh, excellent! Well, you should get him on uh, on the roundtable. <laughs> Yeah, he. I've talked to him once actually. I did a I did a, a group panel of uh, superhero designers. I got him and uh, Steve Kenson and Cam Banks and wow and a couple of, and a couple of other guys. It was it was kind really of a power it was, panel. It was very intimidating. Uh, <laughs> it's like wow, you know, I've I own something by everyone in this in this chat, and that's a little weird. So <laughs> sure, but but. Uh, 
So, um, what games? What games uh, out there are currently? Uh, other than the, obviously your own stuff, uh, sure. has got you, uh, you know, interested. What what, do you, what have you seen that that looks interesting to you, or you, you know, you came across at Gen Con or or whatever? Right. Well, uh, at PAX, I talked to some of the story gamers, um, and that got me interested in running Fiasco again sometime. Um, I've been looking at. I've been looking at D and D next, right? I've been looking at the fifth edition rule set mm -hmm. with some interest. Um, that's just such a long, drawn out public play test that I, I don't really have an opinion about it yet. Um, other than yeah, okay, it's interesting. Two years away from publication, um, I was very, very excited that the Chaosium guys are putting together a revised Horror on the Orient Express Kickstarter. I saw that. Yeah, which, you know, that's a classic, and it's a shame that no one's really revisited it, right? And, yeah. of course, if anyone should, it would be, hey, get the, the Chaosium crew on. That seems to be drawing a good re reception. I'm back on that. I, um, that's why I was just going to ask if you are backing. Yep, I'm back in that one, and I'm backing Monty Cook's Numenera, which uh, puts me in. The you and you and half half the the free world, I believe. Yeah. Exactly, Monty it's Cook. Like, yeah. I'm not really a science fantasy guy most of the time, but I have to see how this plays out. It looks it looks great, and we'll see next year whether it yeah. really is great. But yeah, I'm glad he he ran with it. So. Yeah, the success of that was just phenomenal and. It just sort of came out of nowhere. It's like, wow. I know. I kind of looked at it and said, well, this could be good. And it has yeah. Monty. So that's a really good sign, but super far future fantasy? It would not yeah. have been <laughs> would not have been my first pick no. uh, of topic, but I think people are getting into it. No, and it's cool because, you know, like we were saying before, it's good to see some sort of diversification of, yeah. of approaches mean, and genres and... I can see it as a property that over time, like if the world is as rich as it seems to be, and if the game system holds up and people get their copies from the Kickstarter next summer, um, you know, it might be the thing that we talk about five years, ten years down the line and say, yeah, you know, that was the first original Kickstarter setting that kind of turned into a bigger thing, right, with novels yeah. or uh, comic books or whatever. I, I can see it going far. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, it, it was interesting because you you got to see in the last few months you you got to see the the you know the D twenty some of the D twenty architects putting out their their next wave of things with yeah. you know because you had Thirteenth Age uh, yeah. from uh, Jonathan Tweet and, and them and you know Monty doing Numenera and so it's it's interesting to see where you know this is what they they've been doing and this is what they're doing now. Sort of yes. Thing, so. Well, they are going direct to the audience with something interesting, right? Um, that's what made those Kickstarters fly. A Thirteenth Age is interesting because it's not really out yet, right? It's still yeah. sort of in beta. Yeah. Um, but has a ton of interest. It's an interesting looking game, I have to say, from the the little bits of it I've read. Um, I've played it a couple times. Parts of it are very very familiar to any D twenty player. Yeah. Uh, and parts of it are not, right? Parts yeah. of it are, hmm, maybe they're familiar to a story gamer or an indie gamer. But, well, you, you can tell that the person that, that designed Over the Edge was involved in this game. <laughs> yes, yes, you can. <laughs> Which is not a bad thing for me, because I, I love Over the Edge, so... Yeah. But, um, it's another one of those wonderful niche games that, uh, that people fall in love with. I think Unknown Armies might fall into that camp, too. Yeah. Um... Now, with the, you're sort of a, I don't know if, what the right word exactly be, sort of a, a, a harbinger of the whole, uh, you know, crowdsourcing, sure. whatnot. Because, I mean, you, you started out with doing the, the patronage projects through uh, Open Design. Yep. And so started sort those of, six years ago. Yeah. Wow. In a while. So, yeah. So, having, it, you know, having seen what's going on now um, if you were if you were sort of launching that same idea now rather than you know six years ago would you have gone with that patronage 
model, or would you have moved hmm. towards a Kickstarter? Do you think? Wow. Knowing, knowing what you know about the, you know the, the differences between the two models and. Right. Well, I mean, the main difference is Kickstarter is about crowdfunding, and the patronage projects, some of which are Kickstarters, but not all of them, are really more about community involvement and collaboration in design. Um, I might have gone the Kickstarter route, honestly, um, because one of the great problems for open design six years ago was we had no money, right? It was like, I want to get cover art, but I pretty much can't afford an A-list or even a B-list artist, yeah. right? It's like, so I go back and I look at some of the early covers. It's like, wow, somebody was really nice to me. They did a good cover <laughs> um, pretty much as a volunteer. Um, and I guess I like the sense of those early projects where it was people are just kicking in because they feel like it. Um, the one worry I have about stuff like Numenera is there's no end of money, right, to support the work, mm -hmm. um, but you're just taking a chance on is it going to be good, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it, the odds are it's going to be great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be, you know, a crappy game, no. No, but it's it's harder to know, uh, I mean, with a collaboratively designed game like some of the open design things or the whole Midgard setting, you get a lot of voices, you get a lot of peer review, frankly, right? so much playtest time has gone into Midgard and so many groups have played it and so many adventures have been written that um, that it already feels like it has big momentum and the hardcover's not out yet. Um, a setting that doesn't have as much community involvement can still be really great, but it's more the product of a single individual. Right. Um, and I, part of what I like about role-playing games is that they are shared experiences, right? They're shared when you're playing them around the table. Uh, they're shared when everybody is playing the Forgotten Realms or what have you um, and telling their stories about um, about a particular place. So, so that's what I love about the crowdsource collaborative part of open design. And it, we've seen it in the projects that are coming down the pipeline right now. There's... Uh, there's one called Journeys to the West, which is pretty much seafaring, Ray Harryhausen, let's go find some islands kind of adventures. Um, and it turned out beautifully. Um, I'm not going to do spoilers on it, but there's six adventures and seven islands. You know islands. how gamers feel about spoilers. I'm not going to go there, but there's <laughs> there's like six adventures, seven islands, a bunch of seafaring monsters. All right, I'll say one spoiler. There are rum gremlins in one of these. Ooh. <laughs> I'm like, rum gremlins? Of course, it seems obvious in <laughs> retrospect. And they're hilarious, and they're um, they're one of those monsters that are very memorable. I had a chance to play that uh, adventure at PaizoCon this past July, and they were the hit of of the scenario. Right? People say, "Well, that was a great adventure." Yeah, it was your favorite part. Oh, the rum gremlins. <laughs> so, so those will be out in public in the uh, in the Journeys to the West project, and it's the kind of thing where it was brainstorm some monster ideas, and the best dozen. Uh, got statted up. That's cool. Um, now, I mean, the, you, I, I could see that there is a way that you could use Kickstarter for collaborate, you know, in a collaborative way because you, oh, sure. you can't you can phrase you know pledge levels as you know, give us fifty bucks and make an NPC or yep. that sort of thing. So yeah, it, but it's not required to do right. it that way. Right. And, and I think some people are right not to go down that road. It's more work. Oh, yeah. to publish that way, and it's slower because you do more playtest and more iteration and brainstorming takes time. Um, if you've well, already got a product, right, you just yeah. need the money to print it. Yeah. Well, and I mean, really, <coughs> in, in even in a collaborative effort, ultimately, there is one person who gets to go, you know, that just is stupid. Yes. Or, you know, more and, diplomatically than that, perhaps. It, but, sure, you know. but uh, thanks for your suggestion, right? Yeah. That's... Yeah. <laughs> And there's always that person in a in a Cobalt Press release, right? We've always had the benevolent dictator at the top, and that person's called the lead designer, and what they say goes. Because otherwise, people just sort of argue in circles, and it never goes anywhere. And yeah, that no, I've person seen is that. yeah, that person's held accountable to turn over text to the editor on such and such a date. So they're highly motivated to get it done. Yeah. 
Now, looking back over, you know, how you've the the history of the open design stuff, um, and you know, the twenty twenty hindsight, is there sure. anything that you would have done differently going back? Hmm. Other other than you know, had money to get <laughs> had money artist. to pay an artist. <laughs> yeah, that that would have been good. Um, Yeah, you know, most of it was learning by doing, and a lot of it was, uh, we got better every single time a new release came out, right? So, other than taking what I've learned from six years of publishing that way, it's hard to say, yeah, I would have done it differently. Um, I've had great collaborators, I continue to work with a bunch of them to this day, um, and, you know, we've sort of won any awards and Origins Awards all along the road. So I'm hard-pressed right. yeah, hard to say we, we did it wrong. It's just we had a learning curve, and it took yeah. time. Well, I mean, I'm not necessarily saying, you know, you did things wrong, obviously. Right, but, but would I do it differently? I think yeah. maybe um, there's certainly room to have done uh, bigger projects earlier. And probably the one thing that I know tripped us up was every time we tried to dual track rule systems, it's like, all right, we're going to write this for 3.5 and 4th edition. Ooh, yeah, that never works. <laughs> that never works. I don't know why we tried, right? Well, I know why we tried, because we had people in both communities who wanted, who wanted to participate. Um, and we did our best by both, but I think that was a mistake, and we should probably have just skipped that. We don't. Would you have broken them out maybe into like two books, one for each instead? Oh, well, we did it in oh. two books, but that meant doing two rounds uh, of layout. And yeah. two, you know, I mean, it's twice as much work. True. And um, and by the end, everybody's like, okay, we're kind of sick of the topic because <laughs> we've done it twice. Twice, yeah. Um, so I probably would have just said, you know, we're, we're doing that. We're doing one project for one group and a different project for the other rule system would have been the smarter way to go. Now, speak, speaking of, of uh, art and similar things, uh, you just came out with an app. Yes. Yes, my first app. I didn't do any of the coding. <laughs> <laughs> All I did was publish it. Um, it's a map app. It's called the Midgard Atlas, and it is a really gigantic uh, map. It's like I don't know what it is, 15,000 by 20,000 pixels or something. It's huge. Uh, it's the entire world of Midgard. It has all the major cities. You can touch your iPad and up comes, you know, the city of your choice, and all of a sudden you're in a city uh, map, and it's easy to get back to the whole world. And we're looking to add a few additional features, but the main thing was let's do an atlas that's totally zoomable and scalable, um, and all connected as opposed to a poster that's sitting on the wall. So it's a lot more, how do I say, animated, uh, a lot easier to get down to the detail you want, um, and we've been getting great reviews. So. Yeah, say I've been hearing a lot of really good talk about it online, so well, I people mean, are it's... just sort of blown away. Well, for four bucks, you're getting a better experience than any paper poster you'd ever get, right? It's like if you had the same number of maps in an atlas, it would be at least 50 or 60 pages. It would cost you 20 bucks. Yeah. And it wouldn't do what this does. So I think it's one of those cases where um, it would be nice to have a map this good for every setting, not just Midgard. Now, when this was first suggested, were there a lot of people at the table with that... Uh, are you crazy? Look, uh, I mean, uh, or maybe <laughs> I think. Well, I, the hard part was we wanted to do everything, right? We wanted to like, you know, put in route finding mechanisms and some sort of uh, currency exchangers, and you know, zoom into the dungeon and in-app purchases, and it's like, okay, let's just get the maps out first, right? Yeah. Um. And so the hardest part of it was scaling it back to something that we could ship, because um, it's a huge app, uh, and just getting the maps to move correctly and scale 
um, it's a lot of work. And I'm fortunate to have worked with a very talented iOS designer, uh, developer. And yeah, we'll, we'll have some more conversations about what features to add next. But yeah. the crazy part was, you know, can we, can we find something that's entertaining enough that people will throw a few bucks at it and then grow it into something bigger? Did you have a lot of hassles with uh, approvals or, you know, getting it through the, the app store? I would say less hassles than I expected, right? I've heard all the horror stories of it'll take weeks, they're going to reject this and that. But we didn't do in-app purchases and we didn't do, you know, it's not a lot of text other than the map text, so there's not much to get offended about. Um, <laughs> I don't know, people's, uh, you know, capability of, of being offended is always uh, amazing it is, to watch. Is a, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yes, it is. But uh, but the approval process went really smoothly. And uh, I would say it was just a, a nice, straightforward launch of, hey, here's this mapping application. Um, and what we're getting most now is, is hey, when is there going to be, you know, an expansion or yeah. more to it? Do you see uh, yourself doing another app? Probably. Uh, if we do... I mean, I can see doing an app that's like connected to Journeys to the West, right? It's a giant seafaring uh, campaign, lots of islands. Wouldn't it be nice if you had ocean charts and some sort of, you know, sailing and wind and storm generation? Um, yeah, that could be really neat. Uh, it could be other apps that are more like a character generator. I don't know. I'm not, I mean, Cobalt Press is not a software house. Yeah. So this is really an experiment. Um, if it does well, we'll try it again. But we don't really have the resources to support iOS plus right. Android plus PC releases plus, you know, um, even the larger RPG publishers like Wizards or Paizo have trouble supporting multiple platforms with simultaneous releases. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, and I, it is a lot of work, and it's a completely different skill set because... Yeah, you know, you you have to have experts that know what they're doing. For otherwise, you're just going to have a pretty looking button that's not going to actually do anything. Exactly, <laughs> and we didn't want that, right? We wanted a, like a luscious, beautiful experience um, that map hounds freak out about, right? And say which which they certainly have been. Which they have. <laughs> so uh, so we achieved that goal. Now we want to expand it with maybe something else. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I. I I remain to be convinced that Cobalt Press is a software publisher, but yeah. um, but we'll try things like this because it's sort of where I've been going for a long time is let's experiment a little and see what yeah. works. Well, I think experimentation is sort of a, a cornerstone of um, your, guy, your publishing house's approach. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've always done things a little differently in terms of the business model, in terms of the creativity and the approach in the adventures. And that's, I think, part of the secret of our success, right? We're small but nimble. Um, Which is a good thing. Yeah, kind of got to be. Yeah. Now, uh, why don't, I guess, uh, wrap things up. Why don't we talk about sure. uh, your the big release of Midgard? When is sure. it coming out? It will be out uh, sometime like early October, first week of October, I would say. So and it's coming right up. That's going to be book in PDF, or is that just a PDF it, release? Or what? Uh, that is everything all at once. So there's a hard cover, there's a soft cover, there's a PDF, there's a few other things that we've got coming, uh, and the map app is already out. So yeah, all of those pieces will hit um, early October. We'll be sharing some sneak previews at the Cobalt site. And yeah, I'm very curious to hear the the reaction, right? I've been hearing for a couple of years now from people who are already fans and supporters. Um, I'm curious to hear as well from people who are like, well, I kind of heard about it, but <laughs> I don't know anything about it, and sure, I'll check it out, right? And they pick yeah. up the PDF or something and say, wow, I can loot half of this stuff for my own campaign, or um, I've heard from a few people saying, yeah, you know, we're pretty much just waiting till it's released, and then we're porting our campaign. Oh wow! Okay. I'm sure that makes makes your your heart go pitter pat. Really it really does. Like yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's meant to be both 
lootable and full of great mechanics for, for Dragon Age players and Pathfinder players and D&D players. Um, and to have, well, you know, we stuck Baba Yaga in there for a reason. She's fun. <laughs> <laughs> much, like, much like putting Ming the Merciless in your dungeon, Baba it's, Yaga is fun. Fun, yes. We didn't try to think about it too hard. It's like, uh, she's a Russian myth. All right, great, we'll go. She's fun, so she's in there, and there's a lot of that. Lovecraftian horrors stalking the waist. Hey, that's fun. Let's put that in there. So, it's coming. Uh, we will make a lot of noise when it happens. And my co-authors on it are Jeff Grubb, who you might know from his work on Guild Wars 2, uh, Forgotten Realms, Spelljammer, a few other things. Oh, I'll a few other things. A few, <laughs> yeah, a, a, a few little things. You should get him on sometime. Yeah, he's yeah. done a ton of work. He was... He, he and I hashed out a lot of Midgard over lunches. Uh, you know, what works, what's the history, what do players yeah. do? Uh, and my other co-author is Brandon Hodge, who is uh, uh, relatively new in the RPG field. He's been around two or three years, at least, as a publishing freelancer, and has done most of his stuff for Pathfinder. So, well, cool. good stuff. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it, and I'm sure a lot of people are, too. So, Thank you. Well, thank you very much for for taking some time out of your out of your busy day to uh, to talk to, to talk with me, and um, probably within the next hour or so, this will go up on YouTube once they get their processing and everything done. So, um, th thank you very much. Thank you.